Good morning, church. Good morning. I'm reading 1 Samuel 2, 12 through 17 in the NIV version. Now Eli's sons were scoundrels, and they had no regard for the Lord. Now it was the practice of the priests that whenever any of the people offered a sacrifice, the priest's servants would come with a three-pronged fork in his hands while the meat was still boiling, and would plunge the fork into the pan, the kettle, the cauldron, or the pot, and whatever the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This was how they treated all of the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the fat was burned, the priest's servants would come and say to the people, who was the person who was sacrificing, give the priest some meat that he may roast it, and he would not accept the boiled meat. I would not accept the boiled meat from you, but only raw meat. Now, if the person said to let the fat be burned first and then take whatever uh, you want, the servant would answer, no hand is over... No, hand it over now, and if you don't, I will take it by force. This sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. Well, good morning, church. Happy Father's Day to all of our fathers. It is good to be here together. Uh, Before I go any further, I, I need to make an introduction Uh, this morning. We have a new sister in Christ, uh, Ashley Springfield. I believe she's right over here. Uh, Just a little wave. Okay. Uh, Ashley Springfield. (laughs) Ashley and I had the opportunity to study last Wednesday night, and uh, she made the decision to put Jesus on in baptism on Thursday and confess him as the Lord of her life. And uh, she has her beautiful children. Her son, Dante, is nine years old, and her beautiful daughter, Tatiana, is 13. And it is a blessing to have you here and a part of the Mesquite Church Christ family. Good to have you with us. Let me ask you a question. How many of you want to be the very best disciple of Christ that you can be? That's just about everybody. Let me give you an opportunity an opportunity to build upon that. This evening at 5.30, the body of Christ is going to gather again here. And we're going to continue in our series, Becoming Men and Women of Tears. Tears being the teachings, the examples, and accompanied by the relationships and sacrifices of Christ. Think in your mind about the men and women in your life, that when they passed into the next life, you shed tears over them. What was it about that man or that woman that brought you to tears? It was because they were a disciple of Jesus. It's because they lived a life of tears. And I believe if we're going to be the best disciples that we can be, then we need to live by the teachings, the examples of Jesus, but also to couple that with the relationships and the sacrifices of Jesus that come along with it. And so I hope to see you again tonight at 530. I don't think you'll be disappointed. This morning, dads, we're going to take a look at a father under the microscope. And the thing is, I would love to be able to say that, that every child grew up with a model father. But the reality is, is that that's not reality. Some of you here this morning are joining us online. Maybe you didn't have a father in the home. Or maybe the father that you had in the home, when you look back and think about it, you might as well not have had a father in the home. Some of us were blessed with incredible men of God as fathers. But there were men in our life, maybe they weren't our father but they sure did treat us like a son or a daughter. And they were good men, good godly men. Those are the men that we honor. Those are the men that we want to be like. This morning we're going to take a look at Eli. We're going to put his fathering under the microscope. And although I'd love to be able to say that we're going to see a positive example this morning, from the scripture reading, you know that's not going to happen. But there are some things that we can learn. And I hope that we learn some valuable lessons today. Because at the end of the day, dads, we have to step back and we have to place ourselves under that microscope. 
and take a good hard look at fathering in our life. And so before we do that, let's go to God in prayer together. Father God, thank you so much for being our Father. You know, as the creator of the universe, you could have assumed any title, and you wear many. We're seeing that in our study on Wednesdays in the names of God. You wear many names, many titles, but you chose Father above all. You want us to know you as Father above all else. And words cannot begin to express what that means to us. As your children, we love you. And we thank you for all the blessings that you shower upon us. I'm so thankful for the blessing of Christian men. I'm thankful to have had a good Christian father myself and grandfather. I'm thankful for the men in my life that I know that I can go to for fatherly advice. I pray, Lord, that the children that do not have a strong father figure in their life will turn to you. But, Lord, we all know that it's going to take a father figure on this earth to guide them in that direction. So I want to encourage every Christian man within the sound of my voice to take it upon himself to find a child and be that example for them. Lord, as we look at Eli today, help us to learn from his example. Some of the best examples in life aren't necessarily the good ones. Sometimes we learn a lot more from the negative examples. Lord, help us to learn from from him and, and his fathering to be better fathers ourselves. Of course, we know the greatest father of all is you. And we thank you so much for loving us to give us the best gift we could ever receive, and that is the gift of your son. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Spirit, I pray that this message today is your message and that hearts will be opened to the message. And Jesus, thank you so much for going to the cross for us. For we offer this in your name. Amen. When you put someone under the microscope, so to speak, and look at their life, in effect, family, what you're doing is you are conducting a case study of them. And the purpose of a case study is to learn by evaluating what was done well and what was maybe not done so well in real life situations. The case study approach to learning is nothing new to Bible study. The Bible records how people lived. We have the biblical record. We have the biblical story so that we can learn from their examples. And we have many good examples to learn from in the Bible, and we have a pretty good number of maybe not so good examples to learn from in the Scriptures. Romans chapter 15 verse 4 says, Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. You want to know what the Bible's about? The Bible's about hope for you and for me. And today we're going to look at a case study in the Old Testament. We're going to look at the high priest Eli in order to learn something about parenting from him. And his case study is presented in 1 Samuel chapter 2. And it should be noted for the record that being high priest was a very noble job. The high priest was second only to the king in authority, but here's the deal. During this time, there was no king in Israel. Eli was high priest before there was a king in Israel. So consequently, he wasn't only the high priest, but he was also the judge of Israel. And what that means is that he had a dual responsibility. He was responsible for sharing God's word with the people, but he was also responsible for sharing the problems of the people with God. The high priest served for a lifetime, and it was often a position that he passed down to his children. He was a man who was highly esteemed. 
He wore very ornate clothing and was treated with honor and respect. And family, here's the thing. We wouldn't know anything about Eli if it wasn't for his relationship with Samuel. And while Eli may have been doing a good job with Samuel, the reality is is that he was failing with his own sons. Unfortunately, I've seen this all too often in real life. And many of you have too. Where men will give the attention to other people's children that they should be giving to their own children. Our text today says that his sons Hophni and Phinehas are grown men. And it says that Eli's sons were wicked men with no regard for the Lord. Which when you consider that, when you step back and you stop and think about that, that's very ungrateful. Because God had arranged for the priests and for their families to be graciously taken care of. God had made great provision for the priests and their families. In Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 1 through 5, we read that specific parts of the sacrifice were to be given to the priests for their own consumption. And apparently, according to our text this morning, that practice had been altered. They had changed the rules. The accepted practice was for the priest to wait for the sacrifice to be offered to God. Then, as the remaining meat was being boiled, they would stick a fork into it and pull a piece out. But Eli's sons didn't do that. They didn't follow the rules of God. They didn't do that. They didn't adhere to this practice. Before the sacrifice was even offered to God, they determined the cut of meat that they wanted. You see, they were not content with what God had graciously given to them. They wanted what they wanted. You ever been around anybody that's got a kid like that? They want what they want. And so they were not only ignoring God's commands, they were also eating that which was supposed to be and was intended to be sacrificed to God. Unfortunately, that's not all that they did. That's just the tip of the iceberg with these fellows. Verse 22 tells us that these boys slept with the women who served at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And first, this is, this is troubling, but this is troubling because no Israelite was to engage in such temple prostitution according to Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 17. Second, this practice usually was associated with idolatry. And we see that in Numbers chapter 25, verses 1 to 5. Needless to say, the people who were watching this, because people are always watching, right? The people who were watching this were upset and talked to Eli about it. God, who sees everything, was upset and talked to Eli about it. Eli talked to his sons about it, and guess what? Nothing changed. In time, the Bible tells us that God put them to death. Family, if we're going to look at this passage in the life of Eli as a case study in fathering, we need to ask a question. And it's a very important question. That question is this, what happened to Eli's sons? What happened to them? Frankly, we don't have a whole lot of specifics about this. But I think from the context, we can begin to draw some intelligent conclusions about what happened to them. To begin with, Eli may have been guilty of being preoccupied with his work. Eli had a very important job with a lot of demands upon him and his time. Generally, the high priest uh, was at the tabernacle from morning till night. It was an all day. It was a 24-7 kind of a thing. He was at the temple all the time. And here's the thing, let's, let's, let's put it into modern perspective, shall we? I wonder how many times Eli came home well after those boys had gone to sleep at night and instead of waking them up and telling them, hey son, I love you, how'd your day go? 
Instead of doing that, he went to bed instead. You know, maybe he regretted not being able to spend time with those boys. But he had a job to do. He had a job to do. He was tired and he was ready to go to bed. And that job was very demanding of his time and very demanding of his energy. Maybe he hoped that he'd have some time in the future. He'd be able to do that at a later time. We're going to go camping one day. We're going to do this down the road. Maybe he hoped that there would be more time. Maybe he was surprised at how fast those boys grew up. You know, years ago, and you're familiar with the song, Harry Chapin wrote a song about this. It's very true. Father's children need time with you. Because this time together is where values are passed on. This time together is where love is demonstrated, and this time together is where relationships are built. You know what? Eli's situation is not unique. I wish I could say that it was, but it's not unique. Family, we live in a time where both parents are often gone because of their jobs. And it isn't uncommon to work 50, 60, 70 hours or more a week, and it's also not uncommon to work two jobs in order to make ends meet for their family, especially in this economy. But here's the reality. Farmers always have something they could be doing. Salesmen don't make money unless they're working. Truck drivers don't make money unless the wheels are rolling. Overtime is too good to refuse. How many times have we heard that from somebody we know? Man, the overtime's good. I can't can't let that go. Overtime is too good to refuse, and people who serve the public need to be available on demand. Family, any job, any job, can be a magnet that pulls us away from home. And it doesn't have to be a job. You know, it may be a hobby that pulls us away, or a sport that pulls us away, or a volunteer activity that pulls us away from home. It may, don't miss this, it may even be the church. Family, anything that keeps us away from home and takes us away from our kids is a magnet that pulls us away from them. Let me tell you something. Fathers, there's no greater blessing in life than family. And there's no greater success as a parent than seeing our own children embrace the values that are going to carry them and get them through this life. Family, Eli didn't realize that. Eli didn't realize that the most important job given to him by God was to bring up his family in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And you know, one of the prerequisites that the New Testament lays down for leadership in the church is leadership in the home. Leaders must have a good home life. Leaders must be good parents before they should even be considered to be good leaders. In family, a faithful Christian must make time for his family. Something else that we need to consider is that Eli may have been guilty of having an isolated faith. And it's certainly possible, in fact, it's very possible, that Eli and his family spent so much time engaging in temple ritual that they forgot what worship was all about. I've known a lot of ministers who have come to that conclusion. They got so wrapped up in the job. They got so wrapped up in the church. They got so wrapped up in, in, in getting things done that they forgot what worship was all about. 
It's possible that Eli was so used to the routine that worship was his job rather than his privilege. Maybe this is why Hophni and and Phinehas had such a disregard for their temple service. Maybe they had gotten to the point that they saw it only as a way of making a living. And they forgot that it was all about serving God. You know, the old saying is true. Faith is more caught than taught. Fathers, our children are more influenced by the life that we live than the words that we say. They're always watching. They don't miss much. They're always watching. James warns us in chapter 1, verse 22, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, thus deceiving yourselves. Dads, it, if our Christianity is reserved for Sunday only, then our children will quickly conclude that God is irrelevant for daily living. Did you catch that? Dads, if our faith is reserved only for Sundays, then our children are going to notice that. And they're going to come to the conclusion that God doesn't matter the rest of the week. Fathers, if our children see us giving our best to others and not to them, whether it be the job, whether it be the hobby, whether it be some other kid, if we're coaching a team or something, if our children see that, then how can they help but conclude that they're not as important to you as others are? But the same thing can happen. If we spend all our time running to church and never giving up some time to be at a ball game to watch our child play the sport. And when that happens, our children quickly come to resent the church. And the God that we worship. Which reminds us that balance is very important in our life. Fathers, our relationship with our children must be a priority. And it's one of our God-given responsibilities to give our very best to our children. One thing for certain is that Eli was guilty of tolerating the sin of his children. You can't miss that. Eli knew what his sons were doing. He knew what was going on. And he was told by the people what was going on. He was told by God what was going on. But Eli seems very reluctant in his confrontation with his sons. He told them that what they were doing was wrong. But he never did anything about it. He should have made them confess. He should have made those boys confess and apologize for their sin or have them removed from the priesthood. Instead, Eli didn't do anything. He did nothing. In fact, in chapter 2, verse 29, we read these words from God. Listen to what he says. And he's not happy about it. Listen to what God says. He says, why do you scorn my sacrifice and offering that I prescribed for my dwelling?" Why do you honor your sons more than me by fattening yourselves on the choice parts of every offering made by my people Israel? Now family, there's three things we need to notice about that. First, disciplining our children is an act of obedience to the Lord. And it's an act of love toward our children. Second, extreme leniency toward our children is not love. It's not love. But it can be a form of idolatry. Let me explain what I mean. By putting ourselves in our desire to be liked by our children above our responsibility to equip and train our children. When we do that, we put ourselves before God and our children. In other words, we make idols of ourselves. Fathers, God has charged us to train up our children in the way that they should go. And when we turn away from the wrongs that our children do, 
we're turning away from God. And we're abandoning our responsibility to our children. Dads, when we rationalize their attitude, when we rationalize our children's actions, even though we know that they're incorrect, when we do that and when we make excuses for their actions, when we blame others for their decisions, when we condone their wrong behavior, we're not helping our children, we're sinning against God. Third, Eli's toleration may have led to the compromise of his own faith. The Lord says that he and his boys were fattening themselves. And what that means was that Eli was either engaging in or approving of their actions by eating this meat himself. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 18, we read that Eli was a very heavy man. He was a large fellow. He was enjoying the good life. Then one day he fell out of his chair, he broke his neck, and he died. You know, Dad, once we begin to turn away from the wrong in our children's life, it is very, very easy to rationalize those same behaviors in our own life. And fathers, when we compromise the truth for the sake of our children, we weaken the influence of the truth upon them. And if we won't be the strong party in the parent-child relationship, by default, we become the weak party in that relationship. Instead of being the influencer, dads, we become the influenced. And notice something else. Verse 25, we read these words. His sons, however, did not listen. To their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. Now take a good look at that. Those are very sobering words. Father's discipline of our children must be practiced early or our children may become so hardened that they're unreachable. Look at the screen. That's what happened. If we don't discipline our sons and our daughters early, they can go to such a point and their hearts can become so hardened that we can't reach them anymore. What if Eli had gotten involved sooner? You know what? His sons probably would have been saved. As humans, we may excuse reckless living, but let me tell you something, God will not. He'll forgive it. And praise God that we've all been forgiven of our sins. We've all been forgiven of our reckless living. God will forgive it, but He will not excuse it. And there's a big difference. James Dobson's words are very true. Listen to what he says. He says, when your children are young, they will test the limits. If you tell them not to cross a certain line, they will cross it to see what will happen. At this point, your children are looking for a fight, and you ought not disappoint them. Those words are true. Very true. And what he means by that, family, is that we teach our children that every choice has a consequence. And the only way to teach this, brothers and sisters, is to let our children live with the consequences of their decisions. So what does that look like? What does letting our children live with the consequences of their decisions look like? If they get a speeding ticket, you make them pay the fine. If they get suspended from school, confront their behavior first before you ever go to the school and challenge their decision. If our children won't share in the responsibility at home, we don't need to reward them with privileges. If our child forgets an assignment, 
and it's due tomorrow? Anybody ever experience that? If our son or daughter forgets an assignment and it's due tomorrow, do not do it for them. If our child hurts another person, make them apologize. If they're a poor sport, take them out of the game and sit them on the bench. Many of you know that we moved here from Arizona. We moved back to Texas from Arizona. And out in Phoenix and Arizona, they don't do tackle football in the schools until the ninth grade. Now, I thought that was weird, but then again, football is kind of a religion in Texas. And so out there, if, you're, if you want your son or daughter to play tackle football, you have to get involved in a parent-coached league. Well, I went and watched a little bit of this, and I said, no way. Because I can see these dads trying to live vicariously through their children. And they were teaching their children some pretty, some things I didn't want my guys learning. It wasn't just about bad technique. It was just bad attitudes. And so they had flag football. And so they played flag football, and I coached their team for three years. We only lost two games. We were good. It was mostly made up of kids from church and their youth group. So we were in a game, and we were winning big, and my son Trevor caught a pass, and he took it in for a touchdown, and he celebrated on the way in. Well, right before we lined up for the conversion, I called timeout, and I pulled my team off the field. And I walked up to Trevor, and I said, that's not right, son. You know better than that. Come with me. The teams weren't on opposite sides of the field. We're on the same side of the field. We walked over to the other team, and I walked up with the coach, with Trevor, and I said, Coach, my son has something to say to you and your team. And Trevor apologized. And the coach was very thankful for that. And I think Trevor may have thought that that was it, but I parked him on the bench for the rest of the game. I texted him last night. This was probably, I don't know, this was six or seven years ago. I said, son, you remember that game where I made you apologize to the coach and the other team for celebrating on the touchdown? He he just laughed and said, yeah, I remember. Mission accomplished. I said, well, I may share that story tomorrow. Are you okay with that? And he laughed and he said, yeah, it's okay. That's okay. Now, there's a lot of people in this world that would say that was cruel, what I did to him. Let me tell you something. If it was anybody else, I'd have done it to them too. And the parents can just get mad about it. But I guarantee you that son would not forget it. I told my players, if you act unsportsmanlike, it's an embarrassment to you, whether you realize it or not. It's an embarrassment to your team, your parents, and it's an embarrassment to me, and we ain't going to do that. So it wouldn't matter who the kid was. That's what was going to happen. I didn't treat them any differently than I'd treat my own. But some people would say that's cruel. That's not cruelty. Family, that's disciplined parenting. And if Eli had done more than lecture his sons, they may not have had to die. Family, Eli's story shows us that even the most religious people can lose their children if they don't give the time and attention to that relationship that is due. So what can we do? What can we do? We can lecture less and we can demonstrate Jesus more. We can show our children that Christ's love has changed us. For some of us, this is a time to step back from our fathering dads and do an inventory of our life and ask ourselves some questions. Number one, can we give more time to our families? Number two, can we give better time to our families? And number three, have we been abdicating the responsibility of leadership in our home? Have we been pushing more on mom than she can handle or should handle? Family, it's time for fathers to remember that God calls us to serve Him. 
First and foremost, God calls us as a father to serve Him. And the first thing that God wants us to do as His followers is to share Him in our home. Because brothers, sharing Jesus in our home is second only to making Christ the center of our own life. Dads, when God places your fatherhood under the microscope, what does He see? And what example and legacy are you creating for your children? The greatest example and legacy any of us can leave behind is our commitment to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Dads, when you look under the microscope, how does it look? Are there some things that need to change? Do you need to recommit your life to Christ so that you can be a better dad? Do you need us to pray with you and pray for you? That's what the church family's for. Nobody's going to look down on you because you're not getting it done like you want to get it done and like God wants you to get it done. There's not a father in this room or joining us online that doesn't understand what that's like. We want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. Maybe the decision that you need to make today is to fully commit your life to Christ by confessing Him as Lord and putting Him on in baptism and washing all the guilt of your sins away so that you can be the best Christian, best husband, and best father that God calls you to be. If you're looking for a church home and you're joining us today in the auditorium or online, if you're looking for a church home, I hope you found it because we want you here with us. Whatever your need this morning, don't leave today without that need being met together while we stand and sing.